Okay, ground source heat pumps. This is another particular favourite of mine. Um, and with all these things, you'll, you can talk to three different people and get three different op options of what their thoughts are and what's good and what's bad. I particularly think ground source heat pumps have a lot going for them, especially in older properties. Now I know that a lot of you will have been told by certain salespeople or manufacturers who have an axe to grind that heat pumps don't work well with old buildings, you can't run them with radiators and like that. If you pick the right heat pump and you do it properly, of course you can. There are heat pumps out there that will put out 75 degrees centigrade. A boiler only puts out 80 degrees centigrade. It is true, however, that a ground source heat pump runs the lower the temperature, the more efficient they are. But it is very rare that you need 80 degrees going through your radiators. In fact, it's dangerous to have 80 degrees going through the radiators. You will scald yourself. It's that if you own a care home, a care home, it's against the law to have 80 degrees going through the radiators. It's not allowed more than 50. So it is very easy for a ground source heat pump to put 50. And if we work on weather compensation, then actually most of the time you'll find that if a radiator was designed for an 80 degree flow, it normally, on average throughout the winter, probably only needs about 45 degrees going through it to maintain temperature in a room. So there's a lot of opportunity here. So ground source heat pumps take work by taking low grade heat out of the ground and converting them to high grade heat. The, if a heat pump is installed properly, and I mean properly, you will get on average about 4 kilowatts out for every kilowatt that you put in. Now a kilowatt of electricity costs about 12 pence. So if I divide that by 4, then it costs me about 3 pence per kilowatt hour to run the heat pump. Mains gas costs about 3.5 to 4 pence per kilowatt hour to burn. Oil costs between six and eight pence per kilowatt hour to burn. So a heat pump will reduce your running costs by between 50 and 70 percent if you're on oil or, or propane. If you're on mains gas, it's probably not worth doing at the moment. The payback period will be 30 or 40 years. Most of you here will be dead by then. So um, it, it, if, however, the government grants come in as they're supposed to, then the payback period will be reduced by 75%. So the payback period will go from, if you're on oil, from 12 to 15 years to 3 to 4 years. If you're on gas, from 30 years down to 10 years. There are three or four ways of getting energy out of the ground. Uh, on the right hand side, if you're happy, lucky enough to have a lake or a pond or a flowing stream and we can extract heat straight out of the stream, that is the most efficient way. If you're lucky enough to have a few acres of land, then we can bury ground loops in the ground and extract heat directly out of the ground. If you don't have a lake or if you don't have enough ground, then we have to do boreholes. Boreholes are expensive to do. To give you an idea, to dig a metre ditch a metre deep and a metre wide costs around about five pounds per metre. So if you need a 30 kilowatt heat load, you probably need 500 metres of trenching with a thousand metres of ground loop, maybe a bit more, 1,500 metres of ground loop, 700 metres of trenching. If you dig a borehole, it's almost 10 times as expensive as digging trenches. It costs around about 40 pounds a metre to dig a borehole by the time you've done the headroom works, etc., etc. So, the most expensive way of installing a ground source heat pump is with vertical boreholes. The next most expensive way is by burying the pipes in a field or trashing your garden. And the cheapest way and the most efficient way is if you have water, flowing water or a large lake or a pond. Two pictures here. One is how to do it properly. And basically what you see here on the left hand side is a trench roughly speaking a metre deep, probably 1.2 metres wide, and that's for a very technical reason. A 15 tonne excavator has a 1.2 metre wide bucket. <laughs> um, it does mean that we can sort of guarantee to have the pipes at least a metre apart. And then, typically in a sort of clay type soil, you would then want to move over four metres and dig the next trench, and then move over four metres and dig the next trench, and all these pipes then come together in a like a huge underfloor heating manifold and back to the heat pump. In that way, we are spreading the load over a very, very, very large area. 
which means I'm not taking a lot of heat from a small area, I'm taking a bit of heat from a large area, which means I don't freeze the ground. Because if I'm taking 40 kilowatts out of the ground to heat your house with 40 kilowatts, I am freezing the ground. And I've got to not destroy the amount of energy, otherwise you'll find by the end of February there's nothing left. And then heat pumps can be very bad news because ultimately they run on electricity. Yeah. So if you're, not getting, if you're not getting free energy out of the ground, it's all going to come from your electricity bill, which is twice as expensive as the oil that we're using before you put the heat pump in. And that's why you often hear about disasters with heat pumps, with people saying, oh, it's costing me a fortune. It's because it was badly put in. The free energy is the energy that's in the ground or the lake. Get that bit right, and it's marvelous. Get it wrong, it's an unmitigated disaster. So the biggest mistake that we see out there is the picture on the right. If I take that picture on the left and I say I've got one meter between the pipes, or 1.2 meters, and I move over four meters, on average I've got one meter of pipe per four meters of trenching. On the picture on the right, if I've got a circle is 3.142 meters and it's the same meter wide ditch, I've got about five meters of pipe per meter of ditch in that pipe. <coughs> eight to ten times as much energy extraction from one piece of ground on the right hand side as from the left hand side. So what happens with the ground on the right hand side? It freezes. And as the temperature drops below minus 15 in the ground, the glycol that's going around these pipes freezes and the whole thing comes to a grinding halt and you're now heating your house on electricity. And it happens, I would say, in 30% of the installs that I've seen. So although I am very, very, very pro ground source heat pumps, that is the problem. For vertical boreholes, the same thing applies. Don't put the vertical boreholes two meters apart from each other, because you will just freeze a small area. Even if the problem is now going vertically, if you're not careful, what happens is you end up with a 100 meter popsicle in the ground. And then there's no sun to warm the ground in the summer, because 100 meters down, there ain't no sun. So it could take two years to recover. In Sweden now, we have a law that says that every time you dig a borehole, you have to put heat back into the ground in the summer to compensate for the cold heat that you've been taking out in the winter. And it's very easy to do because we tend to have quite warm wind, quite warm sun in summers and very cold winters. So we can just run the whole thing in reverse and put the heat back in the ground to cool our buildings. And the, so in certain areas of Stockholm now, we have to do that by law because we were beginning to cool the, the, the rock. <coughs> so you can see here on the right hand side there's your borehole that is going down normally about 100 meters or so. Um, two, what, one of the problems that most people come up with here is that you know, if, you're, if you're doing things out in the field, don't use joints that are screwed together by hand. Don't use pressure joints. Only welds. So at the bottom right hand side there we can see uh, a joint that's put together by screwing together the pipe. As the years go by, those joints will fail. And believe me, it is not easy to find out where that borehole was in three or five or 10 or 15 years. The one on the top right hand side is a welded joint. It's as good as the permanent pipe. The drilling rigs are not small for this. Don't think you're gonna get them through a side gate into the house. Oh, there's a picture, actually, it's a picture of a church that we did recently, or last year, or two years ago. And there's, there's the drilling rig that you can see that goes beside it. The most efficient way of making ground source heat pumps work is what people now call water source. There is actually absolutely no difference whatsoever in the ground source heat pump at all between a water source and a ground source. It's just the method of extracting the energy. Um, uh, these particular pictures are for a uh, a far 4,000 square meter manor house. Uh, so a lot of pipe went in that lake. The lake flows very well. It's a nice size. There's the loops going up. Now here, of course, it is okay to go in slinkies, as we call them, because the water is moving. So if I'm cooling one area, it just disappears down the river into the next door neighbor's land, and so we don't care about that. 